Good evening. I have a very important question here. When treating several patients, do you think of each one and treat separately, or can you think of them all and then go into meditation and by so doing include them all? No, you cannot. You must take each individual, each case by itself. And this is the only way that I have found practical. When you become aware of the discord, when someone asks you for help, that is the moment in which the treatment must be given, not five minutes later. You are never justified in saying to anyone, I will help you five minutes from now, or I will help you an hour from now, or I will help you tonight. Never, never are you justified in uh, <clears throat> such an attitude toward the healing work. It is as if two times two is five were held right up here before your eyes and you were to say, I'll figure that out later. It would be useless. You would have accepted the mistake. And later you'll have a hard time getting rid of your five. Whenever an appearance of discord is presented to you, that is the moment in which it must be transposed or <coughs> treated. Actually, you are not going, your treatment is not going to do something to somebody. Your treatment is not going to do something to something. And please remember that always in your work in the infinite way. Your treatment is not aimed at doing anything to anybody. Your treatment is a knowing of the truth. And it takes place within you, and it is not projected out upon anyone else. You never give a treatment to a person in the infinite way. You always know the truth. Now, when someone asks you for help and they tell you the nature of their problem, you have certain specific truths which you can bring to your conscious remembrance regarding such situations, and that would be a treatment. But whether or not you knew the nature of the problem, whether or not you knew the name of the patient would really be of no importance if you knew these principles thoroughly and knew that whatever discord is being presented to you has its source in the impersonal carnal mind or mortal mind, which is not a mind but a belief in two powers, and that this appearance, this discord, has no law of God, has no life of God, has no substance of God, and therefore has no power to sustain itself or to maintain itself. Now, if you do that, the very moment the uh, error is brought to your attention, there will be no danger of your first taking it into your consciousness and then later trying to get rid of it you will have disposed of it 
instantly. This doesn't always mean that the healing will be instantaneous. You may get a call later that the patient is somewhat better or worse or just the same, and you may have to treat again, but the treatment will always be. At the moment that it is brought, that the claim is brought to your attention. Now, it may be that an hour from now or two or three hours from now, that that person or that claim will come back to your thought. And if that is so, you must immediately treat again. In other words, you cannot rest in peace until you have had a sense of freedom within yourself about this case that has presented itself to you. And so if it returns to your thought six, eight, nine, or ten times in the next 24 hours, you will treat six, eight, ten, or twelve times. Or else you will have the feeling that it is done and that regardless of how often it returns to your thought, you cannot treat again. Now, supposing while I am talking to you here, the telephone bell rings, I stop talking to you, I answer the telephone, it's a call for help, and I say, I will give you help immediately. Leave it with me. Goodbye. And I turn back to speak to you. But in that instant when I was on that telephone, I was realizing that only the grace of God can operate as a law, that there is no law of disease, that there is no law of infection or contagion or heredity, that there is but one law, the law of God, and all this that's coming to me from that direction is only the arm of flesh, the universal belief in two powers, and by the time I have turned back to you, I'm ready to talk to you. And if that phone rings again, the same process is repeated, and again, and again, and again, but each time I do not turn away from that person or that claim until I am satisfied within myself that I am not accepting the claim, that I am understanding its impersonal nature and its nothingness. Now, of course, <clears throat> no one is ever called upon to handle these claims that rapidly until they are prepared for it. In other words, in the beginning of my work, I had as few as three or four calls in a day or patients, and six and seven, or ten and twelve, and so on, until in the last year of my active practice before starting this teaching work, I took care of 135 cases a day, seven days a week, for 52 weeks. I did it with the help of four telephone lines and an office. But by that time, I was so in this spirit of realization that as rapidly as the calls could come in, I would realize the nothingness and be able to turn to the next. And the proportion of healings would be just about the same as if there were only a half a dozen in a day, because the amount of calls has nothing to do with healing work. It has to do with the developed state of the practitioner's consciousness. Well, after 16 years, of doing nothing but sitting in an office healing work, you can imagine that I had built up to where I could take care of that many calls. Now, I couldn't today because with the 
teaching work and the lecturing work and the writing and the traveling, there are too many interruptions. And so I would not be called on for that many cases. And so I am called upon for about the maximum that I can handle under this situation. So it will be, you need not concern yourself with how the work will eventually develop if you will begin with one, if you will take the one call that comes to you and handle it satisfactorily and completely and perfectly, even if you were to give 20, 30, or 40 minutes to it, or an hour, as long as you handle it thoroughly. There is only one guide that you can go by. If you were ill and calling on a practitioner for help, how would you like to feel that they were treating that call from you? Well, that is about the way in which you must handle the calls that come to you. Be satisfied within yourself that you have given the utmost of your understanding, the utmost of your treatment, and so help your God you can't do more. Then, regardless of the immediate or future outcome of the case, at least you will have a clear conscience that you fulfilled yourself at your highest level at that moment. Now, <clears throat> I realize that others have been taught to make up lists and to give treatments every morning or every night. That is not the way that I have been uh, experiencing in my 30 years in this work. My experience has proven to me that if I take care of the call when it comes to me, and as many times thereafter as the case may come back to my mind, or as the individual may call for help, that I am fulfilling myself. And I have found the finest fruitage from dealing with the situation at the moment that it touched my consciousness, getting rid of it, clearing myself, then being ready for the next call that would come along. And so, in our work, we never recommend that anyone shall delay giving a treatment or wait until tonight, but meet it at the point of contact with your consciousness. And eventually, you will find that it is so simple that you can do it in the space of a two-minute telephone call. <clears throat> but it takes practice and development, and it uh, can only be accomplished by taking one case at a time and being thorough with it. And you'll find, because I did, that whereas in the beginning I often had to give a half hour to an hour to one person later on it boiled down to two minutes but only because consciousness had become attuned and uh, had accepted this principle of no power the principle that we're speaking of the principle of no power is our principle of healing because we are never using a power to heal anybody of anything. We are never even using a spiritual power. As a matter of fact, you learn in this work that you can't use a power, certainly not a spiritual power. You can use physical power, you could use mental power, but you never can use spiritual power. When you enter the realm of spirit, it uses you. You cannot use it. It is the infinite, and you are its individual transparency. Therefore, when you are working according to the principles of the infinite way, you are not using a power to cure disease. You are not using a power to get supply for anyone. You are not using a power to overcome sin. You are knowing the truth 
that every appearance of evil is just a form of mental malpractice. It is nothing more nor less than the arm of flesh or nothingness. It is the carnal mind, the impersonal source of evil, but that which has no law, no cause, no life, no substance, no activity. When you have known that truth, you then become still and let God utter itself. When he utters his voice, the earth melteth. When you hear the still small voice, it thunders insofar as error is concerned. And uh, it isn't something you do. It is something it does by means of your consciousness, which is a transparency for it. And here, I suppose, is the time to explain this to you. The infinite way reveals that there is no such thing as God and. There is no God and man. There is no God and supply. God is infinite. So there can be nothing but God. God must fill all space. Therefore, there is no space for God and somebody or God and something. God is the somebody. In other words, God appears individually as you. You can go all the way back to our original textbook, The Infinite Way, and find that our basic principle is in the word as. As is our major principle. Not God and you, but God manifest as individual you. In other words, the life of God is your life. Therefore, there is no God life and your life. There is no God mind and your mind. There is no God spirit and your spirit. And Scripture says that even your body is the temple of God. So there isn't even God and your body. But God and your body is one. Now, if you perceive the infinite nature of God, you will perceive that God appears as his Son. Therefore, God is the Father and God is the Son. Is that clear? There is not God and a Son, but there is God, the infinite invisible, appearing visibly as the Son of God. That is the only reason that the Master could say, Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me, for I and the Father are one. Now this must be understood as a universal relationship Otherwise, the life of the Master is meaningless. If this were the truth about him and not about you, we could not attain it. We could not achieve it. We have no hope in the world. If God is a respecter of persons, if God has some, set somebody aside and said, but don't you try to attain the demonstration, then why is he the way-shower? if he has no way to show us. But he has a way to show us. The way he lived is the way he is showing us to live. And that way is one with God. Therefore, there is not God and man. There is God expressed as man. Therefore, when we are told, have that mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus, we are told that which is a possibility. Now, don't think that there is a mind that was in Christ Jesus and a different mind which you can't attain 
No. Here it is, and here's the explanation. You have a mind. I have a mind. He has a mind. She has a mind. But actually, that's not true. We all have the mind. It is just one mind. It is the same mind, whether you're expressing it or whether I am. As a matter of fact, your pet dog has the same mind or he wouldn't understand you and you wouldn't understand him. But because there is a bond of understanding between you, it must be taking place through the same mind. Now, let us look at the mind of a child before it has started in school. Do you know that that child's mind is the fully developed, intelligent mind that it will have at 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, or 90? The same fully developed mind of intelligence? The only thing it lacks is the awareness or knowledge of specific things which have not yet been taught it. But if it didn't have its intelligence, it couldn't learn these things. Do you see that? You must have intelligence in order to learn something. So therefore you have your intelligence even before you have knowledge. You have enough intelligence really to learn 57 languages if you would like. And the only reason that most of us only speak one is that our education in the United States has been of such a poor nature that we have been brought up with one language, whereas in foreign countries children speak two, three, and four languages right from childhood up. They have the intelligence for it, and so do we. We just don't have wise teachers. We just don't have boards of education outside of politics. And that's sad, because every one of us should be speaking three and four languages today the same as they can do. We should be able to visit all of the countries and know what's going on inside of them instead of going there like American tourists and looking around for an American movie and an American newspaper. It's sinful to travel this world and see how Americans are restricted from all the things that the citizens of other countries have open to them. And all because we weren't taught how to use our God-given intelligence. And so I know we have the intelligence we haven't been taught properly. Now, our intelligence then is infinite because God is our intelligence. And we can have whatever degree of awareness, whatever knowledge we wish by the use of the intelligence that we have. Now then, this intelligence of our mind is because of centuries of separation from the spiritual world. This intelligence is used primarily on material subjects and mental subjects and therefore is without spiritual illumination. But it still has the potentiality of spiritual illumination the same as it has the potentiality of 57 languages and all the arts and all the sciences. In other words, this mind of ours, and remember there's only one mind in this room. Some of us have used this mind a little bit more than others, and therefore it would appear outwardly as if we were smarter, but it isn't true. There's no degree of intelligence. We are all infinitely intelligent, but we're not all using it, and we're not all using it in the full measure. Now in the same way, every one of us has the potentiality of spiritual enlightenment, so that we may say that the mind of the human race is an unillumined mind. I'm speaking now only spiritually.
spiritually it is unillumined. It may be humanly brilliant. It may be humanly intelligent. It may be humanly creative, but it lacks spiritual illumination. As you are led to a spiritual teaching, from the moment you open your first book, from the moment you have your first interview with a, an enlightened person, your own enlightenment has begun. And enlightenment will come to you, spiritual illumination will come to you in proportion to your seeking of it. In other words, you are the one who makes the overtures. You are the one who makes the original reaching out. You are the one who pursues this search for God. But we are told that if you seek God 1%, God will seek you 99%. In other words, no matter how much effort you and I ever make in this direction, it will really be a tiny little bit of a grain of effort because that's all we know. Therefore, for illumination, the rest is up to the grace of God. In other words, we keep moving toward God, thereby bringing God moving toward us more rapidly. Then spiritual illumination dawns. Now, when this light dawns in your consciousness, and you behold God as infinite, you realize instantly that there can't be God and something else. Otherwise, God would be that much less than infinite. Therefore, God must exist as the substance of all that is. God, then, constitutes all that is, so that you no longer can look to God for your health, because there is not God and health, but Scripture says, God is the health of thy countenance. In other words, you can't get health, but you can get God. When you have God, you have health. In the same way, you cannot get God to give you supply or send you supply. There is no such thing. That would imply an infinity and then some supply besides that. No, no. God is supply. I am the bread. I am the wine. I am the water, I am life eternal, I am the resurrection. There is not God and a power of resurrection. Where God is, resurrection is. Have it this way. God cannot give us a bomb-proof shelter. God is thy fortress. God is thy high tower. The only bomb-proof shelter there is, is God. When we are hid with Christ in God, when we are hid in the spiritual realization of God as our being, a bomb can't reach us, or a bullet, or a poison. Only as you see God as the secret place of the Most High, as the high tower, as the fortress, as the rock, as the cave, only as you see God as bread, meat, wine, and water, only as you see God as health, harmony, wholeness, only as you see God as companionship or home can you demonstrate it. Over and over again I send letters back to uh, people who write to me, will you please take up work 
for companionship for me or for marriage or for home. And I send it back and I say, I'm sorry, I do not know how to work for those things for you. Should you find yourself interested in learning about God, I'll be very happy to tell you what I know and have learned and how I believe you may find God. And I wouldn't be surprised that if you found God, you would also found those things for which you are looking, for that is what the Master said. Seek not those things. Seek only God, and the things will be added. And when I write letters like that, I am not doing it facetiously, nor to be funny or to be sarcastic, but because I think it's sacrilegious to think of God as a servant living to do our bidding, to supply us with what we believe to be our needs. I believe that this is a horrible form of religion, one certainly of which I want no part. For me, God is the reality. God is the goal of life. I like health as well as anybody else, and supply, and abundance, and companionship, and home. I like all those things as well as everybody else. But I can't think of God as my servant whom I send out to bring them in to me. And on the other hand, I can't even find them desirable outside of God, for I can't find life itself desirable outside of God. To live in the greatest harmony or health or abundance without God would, it seem to me, to be living a very barren life. And so it is that, as far as I am concerned and the activity of the infinite way, it recognizes only the goal for God. It recognizes only the search for God as a goal. It recognizes only the attainment of God as a goal, and thereby discovering the greatest mystery of all, that in the attaining of God we have attained health, harmony, wholeness, completeness, companionship, home, abundance, twelve baskets full left over. Now, if you believe that, then there remains the mode of attainment, and that is not the seeking of things, but the seeking of that mind, which is God, of that consciousness, which is God. And then watch how the consciousness, which is God, as it becomes your individual consciousness, becomes the substance of the harmonies of life. Without your asking, begging, pleading, without your attempting to demonstrate, without your attempting to, attempting to get from God, it becomes automatic in this wise. Oh, if you could only know what it is that I'm seeing that I can't clarify for you as I would like to, that this mind of ours, which right from infancy on is complete intelligence, is likewise potentially spiritual. And as soon as we attain even a small measure of spiritual illumination, we perceive that God is our consciousness, and our consciousness is the substance of all form, and therefore it is our consciousness that appears outwardly. Once a practitioner had to make a trip to Europe, and he left his entire practice in my care. And when he came back, he said that his patients were so pleased with my work and so happy with me that he felt 
that he shouldn't take them back. And therefore, he was going to go to another part of the city and set up a whole new practice. And then I explained this to him about consciousness. He couldn't have done that if he'd wanted to. These patients were his own consciousness appearing as that form. And he couldn't any more give away those patients than he could give away his own consciousness. He couldn't transfer his consciousness to me, and so he couldn't transfer his patients. Yes, yes, in a temporary absence, he could ask me to care for them and ask them to let me care for them, but that's quite a different thing with than giving them away or giving them up. It can't be done. It can't be done. That is why once you perceive this, you are forever lifted out of competition. Never again, whether you are in business, art, science, or the healing ministry, or the spiritual ministry at any level, never will you be disturbed by a word competition. Why? You don't have customers. You don't have patients. You don't have students. You have your consciousness. And your consciousness externalizes itself as whatever form is necessary to you. And anyone who would try to take them from you would have their fingers burnt. Now, they couldn't accomplish it successfully. Once you understand that there is not God and, you will know that there is not consciousness and, therefore there is not your consciousness and your business. No, your business is your consciousness in a specific form. Once you know that the customers that you have built into your business with integrity, once you realize that these represent your consciousness in form, no one can ever take them from you unless you lose your integrity. Then, of course, they find their rightful home. But once they have found their rightful home as part of your consciousness, that's yours. The bread that you have cast upon the waters is yours. The bread that you've cast on the waters can't go into anyone else's hands. It just can't do it. Yours is the bread that you cast forth, and to you it must return because there really is no going and coming. There really is no separation between your consciousness and the bread and the water. It is all consciousness appearing. And so it is. <clears throat> if you have one grain of illumined consciousness, and you have, or you wouldn't be in this room, then you have all of the health and all of the supply and all of the companionship and all of the home you will ever need unless you decide to go out and look for those things and then you lose it. As long as you realize that there is not God and you will realize that God is your consciousness. And that is the second magic word in the infinite way. Go back to that book and find those chapters wherein it is given you that God appears as and God is. And with the two words as and is, you can work out your whole spiritual experience. Now God is, God appears as your consciousness and your consciousness is the substance of all forms. And as you realize this, then, you will never seek for bread, wine, water, or life eternal, or companionship, or customers, or patients, or students, but you will realize that your consciousness is these. 
your consciousness is these. Your consciousness appears as these. Your consciousness constitutes these. Then you'll see there's no sense of separation can ever again get in. There is no separation. <laughs> that I can say to you, that it is literally true that all that the Father hath is yours. But the only reason we don't experience it is there is a sense of separation, and that comes from the materialistic concept of there being a God somewhere, a God and a man. And God is pure, but man is a sinner. And now how are we going to get them together? And how are we going to get this sinning man to get something good from God? Well, I suppose the first thing is to get the sinning man to be good. But what constitutes being good? Well, if you're a Hebrew, go to temple on Saturday. If you're a Christian, go on Sunday. If you are a Vedantist, go four days a week. Well, which of these is good now? Saturday, Sunday, or four days a week? Ah, yes, but it's also good to go into temple with your shoes off. Oh, no, it's good to go into temple with your hat off. Oh, no, it's good to go into temple with your hat on. What is good? How are you going to conform to some kind of good in order to deserve God? And the answer is nonsense. Nonsense. There is no way to get good enough to deserve God, but there is a way to realize God as your being and find that because God is pure, your being is now pure and all the impurities have been washed out. That you can find, that you can find, that as you forget to be good and just remember to make God your consciousness, to live with the realization of God as your being, live with the realization of God as your life, your mind, and the only law operating in you, you will find that the presence of God is a purification. And then you'll find that whatever of a negative nature has to disappear out of our experience will disappear. But it will happen not because we are good. It will happen because God is good and God is infinite and God is omnipresent and there is no room left for badness. Now, all of this comes down to this. God constitutes your being. God is your consciousness, and because God is infinite, your consciousness is infinite, and therefore your consciousness appears as form infinitely. And therefore your business is infinite, your art, your profession, your science, your anything is infinite. And if you're a healer, your practice is infinite. If you're a teacher, your student body is infinite. And there is no limitation whatsoever unless you embroil yourself in limitation. If you keep yourself free from human rules and regulations and live above time and above space and above place, live in and as God consciousness. Live and move and have your being in the truth that God is all that concerns you, that God is the measure of your demonstration. God is the measure of your safety, of your security, of your protection. God is the measure of your wisdom, of your intelligence, of your life. Never limit yourself. And while you probably won't show forth all of that infinity on earth, you will show forth a greater measure of infinity than you ever dreamed that a human being could show forth. All of it comes through the breakdown. 
<coughs> with that word as and is. There is no God and there is only God. But God functions as the life of individual being. God functions as the mind of individual being, as the intelligence and wisdom. God functions as the substance and the law. And as you abide in that and live with that as and is, It's something I wrote a long time ago. It has, uh, has never appeared in print. But I had a copy of it in the Bible. And the subject is time. Yesterday and tomorrow must be discarded in nowness. As long as there is a desire there is a projection into the future. As long as there is a regret, there is a return to the past, both of which are dead, without substance and without life. Now is the only life. Now is the only reality. Now is the only time. The future is only an extension of the now. Sap must flow up from the roots of the tree into the branches to form the buds, flowers, and leaves of trees. However, if there could be a tree consciousness which worried about whether or not there would be enough rain or sun in due season, it would interfere with the normal and natural flow of life. So do we interfere with the free flowing of life by injecting I-ness into the already completed picture, an I-ness which manifests as fear of the past or future, concern, anxiety, desire. There can be no desire, not even the desire to give, for that too feeds the sense of I-ness and bloats the ego. There must be a complete resting. As the ice rests in the water, letting the water project the ice wherever and whenever it will. Time and space are overcome in this practice. Time, by living only in the now and steadfastly relinquishing the past and the future. Space by relinquishing the desire to be any place, resting satisfied in this very place, which is holy ground. So it is that this I-ness, this sense of an I apart from God, is the very devil causing our discords. For, in reality, I is God. God is I. God constitutes all that I am. And therefore, since I am one with the Father, I can say, not that I desire bread, but I am bread. I am supply. I have supply that ye know not of. If God is infinite, and if God constitutes my being, then my very being here contains everything within itself that I shall ever need from now unto eternity. And then all that I have to do is not try to acquire or attain, but to let that which is already embodied within me appear outwardly as form. Two wonderful illustrations we've had in this class. 
we don't have to pray for horses because the divine consciousness has the automobile age coming right into visibility and we can let the horses pass out as automobiles come in. Also, we do not have to murder our populations in order to feed them, for consciousness is providing us with food as we need it. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And if you have four billion more children, it is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He knoweth our need. Therefore, instead of slaughtering the population, let us watch as consciousness appears with this new form of feeding us. And so it is. Your consciousness, because God is your consciousness, your consciousness contains all that you need tomorrow, next week, next year, and unto eternity, but you must develop the practice of meditation in which you can be a beholder and watch as these things appear in your light. The only uh, illustrations I can give of this are that if you wanted to compose music, you wouldn't go out looking up everything that everyone else had written and try to copy it, but you would sit back inside of yourself and wait until God released in you the melodies that you were to receive. Or if you were to write poetry, or if you want to write a novel, or a book of truth, it makes no difference what you wish to draw from within yourself, it is already there. But you must develop that inner beholding which creates a vacuum. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Let this flow. And then that which you need flows out into expression. Just the same whether it's business or whether you need employees or whether you need more capital in your business or a new idea for advertising. It doesn't exist in time and space. It exists within your consciousness and you have to develop a mode of prayer which becomes a listening ear, an attitude of listening so that God's grace may flow out from you. And be assured of this, it will, if you live and move and have your being in the realization that God is your consciousness, therefore your consciousness is the substance of all form and activity necessary to your life. I've been waiting this whole week for that to come out. It was choked up back there and wouldn't come out. But that is that which has been breaking through since our first night. Since the very first time that the words primal substance, primal consciousness came through. And it is this primal first consciousness, first cause, this God, which is our consciousness, which appears as safety, security, which appears as whatever form is necessary to us, and no one can take it away from us, but the fo because the form isn't a form. No one can take your money away from you because your money isn't money. Your money is your consciousness of supply externalized. And those who lose it only lose it for one reason. They have not learned that money isn't money. They haven't learned that money isn't something separate and apart from God. That money isn't something separate from infinity. But if God is infinite, money must be a part of infinity. And if God is your consciousness, then your money is part of your consciousness. And your home, and your family, and all that pertains to you, no one can take them from you, neither can time or space. 
take them from you, for they exist not as material forms separate and apart from consciousness, but as consciousness itself appearing as individual forms. Thank you. Thank you, Father.